All right. Good morning breakfast with bacon fans. And I actually am going to add another line here. We're going to, we're doing this in coordination with Queen of Peace Media. And those of you also listening through Radio Maria, CMAX TV, uh, God bless you all for being here. I am so excited to bring you today's show. It is part two, which for some of you, it's going to be part three because our last show, part one, was so long. It was two hours of incredible uh, testimony from Zachary King that I've broken it into two pieces. So this is part three for some of you, part two, depending where you find it. But all in all, I just want to reintroduce my guest, Zachary King. He is a former satanic high wizard. And I know he's not known by that. He is a son of the most high God and he has become a Catholic missionary of sorts. And Zachary, I think it's fantastic that you have the last name King. It occurred to me today because you are a son of the King. Has that ever occurred to you? A little bit off topic, but. A lot of people bring that up. (sighs) How perfect is it? So on our last, I'm sorry, on our last broadcast, we went, started with Zachary's childhood and how he, how can a kid who's going to Baptist church with his mom and dad, he's a quote unquote good kid, he has good parents. He's in their house. They're attentive to his life to a degree. How does a child like that get into Satan worshiping, which took place when you were, I can't remember, 10 or 12? Uh, officially 12. 12. And how does that happen? So you lived the lifestyle, eventually rising to the heights of, of Satanic High Wizard, which at one point you said to me, there were about only seven to 10 in the world at any given point. Is that true? Uh, Generally, the number is between two and five. Wow. The the number could be as low as one or as high as 10. Wow. So out of the 7 billion people in the world, you were one of those 10. So to have gotten so high, for those who didn't hear our first show, just kind of in a short two minutes-ish, Tell us about that moment, maybe longer if you need more than two minutes, that you received that miraculous medal and your life was never the same. And so today we're going to take you from that moment of conversion to what's been happening since then. Do do you mind kind of recalling that? No, that's fine. Uh, This woman came up. I worked in a jewelry store, uh, Piercing Pagoda, and she came up to buy a pair of gold earrings. And I sold her the pair. And at the end of the transaction, um, you know, we were having a promotion at that time that if you call the 800 number on the, on the uh, receipt, took a survey, you might win $1,000. And I explained that to her. And she told me she had something for me, too. And I thought she was going to pull out a Jack Chick pamphlet and tell me I'm sending. I need to drop to right. <laughs> beg for forgiveness and all of that. And I don't have that option. And instead, she pulled out this little uh, blessed miraculous metal, but I didn't know what it was. It was just a worthless gold-colored piece of tin to me. And, uh, you know, I took it in my hand, and I'm expecting it to, you know, it's, she's talking about how powerful it is, and she says something really weird. She says, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. And I didn't know who the Blessed Mother was. Wow. I'm Baptist. We didn't have that title. And... I took it in my hand and my plans were to throw it on the floor, slam it on my counter and tell her it's worthless. There's no power, no mystique to this. And, you know, instead, when I clenched my fist around it, my store and my mall completely disappeared. I'm standing in this darkened void and this woman, Marianne Wickman, is continuing to talk to me. And she tells me about the magic spell I did last night. And that's of the devil. And you know, that I've committed over a hundred abortions and that's of the devil. And I've split over a hundred churches and that's of the devil does about nine or 10 of my sins and all of them end with, and that's of the devil. And I'm terrified. I want to attack this woman with magic, but her magic is clearly stronger than mine. And she says, again, the blessed mother is calling you into her army. And instantly I knew that was the mother of God. And when I realized that it was the mother of God, Mary showed up. She smiled at me, a smile I knew I didn't deserve. You know, I was acutely aware of my 146 assisted abortions. And she took me by the hand. She turned me around. Divine mercy, Jesus was standing behind me. You know, in that instant, I knew that I had not sold my soul to the devil. 
when I was 13, I knew that Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior. I knew that all my Satanism, my magic, my new age, and my occultism was false. And I knew everything Catholic was truth. And the Blessed Mother told me my job was to help her end abortion. And I opened my hand and I was back in my store, back in my mall. This woman, Marianne Wickman, told me where she went to Mass. And I started going to daily Mass there the next day. You know, I heard this story before and just hearing it again, I'm, I'm, in, no, I'm in awe. I'm just in awe, first of all, at how our Lord chooses to get people, what he needs to show a particular soul. The, the idea that you got to see the Blessed Virgin, because you said at first you saw Marianne, but then it was the Blessed Virgin was with you. Yes. Right. Right. So, so here you are being part of these, you know, this heinous abortion ritual as a satanic high wizard. And she chose Christ, chose you to send his mother to. Have you ever sat back and really just thought about the awe of that? Like you were chosen? I've had people at my talks ask me, why was I chosen? And I've thought of different reasons why. I mean, one of my reasons would be maybe I was the worst sinner in the mall. Maybe I was as bad as you could get at that on that day. Um, maybe I had learned everything in Satanism that I needed to know for me to bring the message to the people. Um, as I never planned on bringing a message to anybody. You know, I didn't want anyone to know at that point that I had been in a satanic coven. I was addicted to magic, so I couldn't stop doing that. And I, you know, Satan, Satan's rules are, if you're not attacking the devil, he pretty much leaves you alone. So there was no church out in the 90s. We attacked, we stopped attacking the Baptist church because we watered down their church. We watered down their faith. So, you know, and there's no other Protestant church that he attacks. So if he's not attacking your church, why would you belong to that church? Right. The only other church he attacked was the Catholic church. And I couldn't understand why, because my dad told me that all the Catholics were going to hell. So to me, there was no church to belong to. You know, there's no holy Protestant church and all the Catholics are going to hell. I was looking for a church, but I didn't see where there was one, you know, to actually belong to. So then to me, finding out, you know, like the infusion of knowledge that I got at the moment of the medal and realizing that, you know, Jesus was my Lord and Savior, that I had not sold my soul to the devil, that was huge. But the final line of realizing that everything Catholic was truth, when I'd been taught the opposite, you know, was an incredible realization to get, you know, to realize that, you know, yes, I have a lot of studying ahead of me. I have to really look into what I can find out about the Catholic Church, you know, but, you know, getting you that. You knew. Yeah, you knew it was the whatever, truth. Whatever I found was going to be true. Yeah. You know, and it's most people don't get that right off the bat. You know, most people have to discover that the Catholic Church is truth. You know, I was given right off the bat, it's truth. Find out what you want. Did you feel like St. Paul? You remember when he had his Saul to Paul moment, he fell off the horse, he was blind, and then he was taken to the home of Ananias. And while he was there, he recovered his sight. And then he was there. I think it was over a year. It might've even been up to three years. Someone may know better than me, but I, I am under the understanding that's when he was getting educated and learning about the faith. And then he, he was sent out and I met Peter and the rest of the apostles. Yeah. Did you feel like you had to have this moment of sucking in and learning the church and getting information? so that you too could go out and be the evangelist slash missionary that you are now, or was it a little bit different? You had the knowledge, you had the wisdom, was there schooling involved? Kind of what was that process? I, it, it didn't even occur to me that I was the modern day St. Paul, that that wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't looking for a title. I wasn't looking to be compared to anybody. You know, I, I 
had other people tell me that that was what my story was like to them, right. you know, and they compared me and I, I didn't want that. I didn't want to, you know, it, St. Paul is St. Paul. I, I'm not stealing his thunder. I'm not trying to be St. Paul. You know, the closest I want to become, I want to be Christ-like. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not looking to, you know, to be the next St. Paul, you know, but the comparison is there. I mean, I'm, I'm blind now, but, you know, I wasn't blind back then, but I was knocked off my horse. I was the high wizard, you know, and to me, I was the most powerful man in the world. You know, even when I was working in a jewelry kiosk, I was still, when you're made the high wizard, it's for life. You stop being the high wizard when you die. You know, so I believe that I was still the high wizard when I was in the journal, you know, the, the jewelry kiosk, you know, so all of a sudden I'm not the high wizard anymore. You know, Jesus had the power to take my high wizard title away, you know, and to take the urge to do magic away. You know, I'm no longer wanting to do magic. You know, it's an amazing place to be to me. I've been doing magic since I was 10 and I stopped when I was like 41 and ever since January 2008, I have not had the urge to practice magic. And my mat, it was addiction. I, you know, I understand when people say that they're addicted to heroin and they can't stop. I was addicted to magic and couldn't stop. You know, I looked forward every day to that. When I woke up in the morning, I had to do a magic spell. And it didn't matter what it was, how simple or how complex it was, I had to do it. And then during the day, I had to do another one. And at night, I had to do another one. And before I went to bed, I had to do another one. You know, and whatever that was, it could be as completely simple or really complex, but I had to do one. And no matter what it was, you know, I was like that, that addict that has to take the next pill or smoke the next joint or, you know, even somebody addicted to porn or, you know, whatever the addiction was, I had it. Yeah, you know, and there's I, never enough and you always need more right. after that mm -hmm. moment. And, and nothing, nothing takes care of it. You do the magic spell in the morning. Oh, that feels great, but I need to do another one. You know, I can't stop with just one. You know, if I could do spells all day long for 24 hours a day, I'd have done it. So and what did it take for you to break? You said January of 2008. Is that when your conversion happened or did you have yes. this conversion? And, and then... I was given the medal. To me, I felt like I was instantly Catholic. I mean, I, I, I had to go to uh, like an RCIA type program. My RCIA was going to Monsignor Lavalle from anywhere from 30 minutes to three hours a day, anywhere from once to seven days a week from January through May. And then in May, he officially brought me into the church. Did you tell them? When Marianne handed you that medal, uh, you said you didn't go around telling people. When did she or your Monsignor or priest or the others in your life start learning of your past? And when you did, were they like stunned? Or did they judge you? Or were they just more, this is an amazing miracle, praiseworthy type of thing? What kind of reception you did know, you receive? A good Catholic will not, will not judge you. Uh, these people did not judge me then pretty much it was within that week of being given the medal, I told Marianne where I came from, what, I would be, what I'd been doing. And she brought Monsignor to my house so he could bless it. And me and my wife had been looking for, um, when I first came, when my, I was first given the medal, it was probably, it wasn't the first week that Monsignor came over. It was probably two or three weeks later. And we'd been looking for a crucifix and I just couldn't find the perfect one. And then when Monsignor came over to bless my house as a gift, he brought me a crucifix and I couldn't find the perfect crucifix because Monsignor Lavalle had it. And we put that one up. It was a beautiful crucifix. And, you know, it, he came over and when she had him tell, you know, she says, could you tell Monsignor what you see in the Eucharist? And I said, well, Jesus, of course, don't you? And he said, well, absolutely. And then when him and Marianne went outside, he told her that, you know, she told me later that he said, 
he's a former Satanist and he sees Christ in the Eucharist. We've got to make him Catholic. He's got Catholic written all over him. So he had me start coming to see him. I mean, I've heard nightmare stories about RCIA, how that a lot of times you, you learn heresy, but you're taught that it's the way that we believe. Right. And so he didn't want that to happen to me. So he taught me himself. Wow. And, and it was an incredible, you know, it was incredible that he took the time to teach me, you know, that, and he was there for every question, any problem, any issue. I mean, when, when I, I first, you know, it became apparent, you know, he told me to, um, to write down what I wanted to confess. And he said, I would use the 10 commandments as a guideline. And he says, you know, but it doesn't have to be war and peace or Ivanhoe, you know, <laughs> you know, just condense, you know, be, be approximately 146 ritual abortions, approximately this many thefts, approximately. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, just be as concise as you can. You don't have to expound on anything. You don't have to go off on any stories, just list the facts. Yeah. And doing that, it still took me about 45 minutes to do my confession. And, but you know, I had never been, remember I grew up Protestant and then was a Satanist. I had never been in a state of grace. Wow. So I didn't know what that was like. And I went in and did my confession 45 minutes later, I'm done. I'm given my penance and, and I was fearing my penance. I didn't know what it was going to be, you know, and it's like, I got like a Hail Mary, a glory be in and our father. And I was like, whoa, that's it? After everything I did? And then I was given absolution. And it was an incredible feeling. I mean, I, I didn't realize I had the weight of the world on my back until I no longer had the weight of the world on my back. And I felt like I was floating out of the confessional. And I felt like I was on top of the world. And then... The fear hit me because I'm never going to be confessing that much sin again. I'm never going to have those sins to confess ever again. And I feared that I was never going to feel that good after confession because I'm never going to have that weight that much on me. But you really were an addict then because the addict really likes that instant feeling. So you had the magic for years and you love the feeling of having just performed one of their spells. And then now here you are just, I, get, I work with couples, as you know, who are, you know, divorced and working to get their marriage and so much infidelity and people are addicted to that feeling of when you first fall in, they say fall in love. I say fall in lust with someone. So it is very understandable how our physiology and our psychology and our spirit together can sometimes war in terms of the fleshly desires. So that, that is so awesome that you say it that way. I once again, wanted to re feel that feeling of having the, the weight of the world off of you, but. Um, so. Well, it was kind of a praise God kind of thing, because the next time I had to go to confession, you know, I had one or two sins. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so, I mean, it wasn't the 45 minutes to go to confession. It was, you know, two or three minutes. But I knew instantly when I sinned that I wasn't in a state of grace. And that the only way I could get in a state of grace was to go back to confession. And, so, and I do you believe that you received an extra, I'm sorry for interrupting, uh, but do you believe that you received uh, some sort of extra sensitivity because of your closeness to Satan in all those decades? And then now you knew the extreme opposite. Of course, you're not me, so you don't know what it feels like for me to go into confession, but do you feel like you had a higher sensitivity? You could see Jesus in the Eucharist. You could feel the weight of the world come off of you. No. Yes. I believe that because of the, the previous, the life that I had come from, where I recognized evil, evil, when I was in the world of evil, evil gave me comfort and holiness hurt, made me sick. I didn't want to be around it. I didn't want to be near it. You know, if somebody sprayed holy water on me, I would have run. 
I don't want to be touched by it. I don't know what it's going to do. I don't know what it's going to feel like, but I don't want to be a part of it. You know, I, I don't want to be near anything holy. I don't want to be, you know, that that's very threatening to me. And all of a sudden, I want to be good. I want to be holy. I want to be in that state of grace and recognizing that as a Protestant, I had zero way to get into a state of grace. I would never be, if I had a state of Protestant, I'd have never been in union with God. No matter how much I love God and might want to stay in church, I had zero way to get into a state of grace. Wow. And as a Satanist, I didn't care about a state of grace. And suddenly I'm Catholic and I want to be in a state of grace 24 hours a day, you know, as much as I can be. And whenever I would sin, I would know I had sinned. I would know that I'm no longer in a state of grace and I have to get back to confession. You know, I have to go to confession. I have to get absolution. You know, I have to get back into my state of grace. I've got to do my penance, you know, and then I would be back in my state of grace. You know, if I was around somebody that was possessed, a lot of times if they're possessed, they can't be around me if I'm in a state of grace. And I, I don't understand why that affects them, but it apparently does. And if I get close enough to them, they can't talk. They Can get, you tell that they're possessed? Is it yeah. you and your spirit immediately? Yes. Yeah, that, that's, I guess, one of my gifts. Are you able to tell them that, assuming that they'd be that open they, to it? They generally know. Um, a lot of the people that I come in contact with that are possessed are going through exorcism. Uh, one of my jobs with a lot of priests, they call me, let me know the case, and then I call the person, they're expecting my call, and I talk to them for usually a few hours, and I determine how they became possessed. There's, there's a lot of people that don't have any idea what they did. Um, there was a priest down in Florida that I was working with, and he's, he knows the woman's possessed, but they can't figure out how. The entry point. The entry point, because she says all she does, she goes to school. She does. I, I think she has a part-time job. So her entire life is going to the gym, going to school, going to work. That's all she does. She doesn't go to movies. She doesn't go to concerts. She doesn't read books, listen to music. She doesn't do anything extra but those three things. And he asked her all kinds of questions and nothing, nothing gave him the answer. So he gave me the phone number, gave me the, the woman's name and the case and all the information he could, you know, and he says, call me as soon as you talk to her and let me know what she says, what, you know, what happens. So I call her up and she gives me the same answers. You know, I go to the gym, I, um, I go to work part time and I go to school. And it spends most of her time at school. And I said, what do you do at the gym? I work out. What kind of workout? I work out. But what do you do? I work out. And I, after a while, she's screaming at me at the top of her lungs that she works out. Are you stupid? I work out. And I said, yeah, but is that spinning, Pilates, aerobics, weights, free training? I mean, what, what do you do? And she goes, oh, I'm sorry, yoga. And I said, oh. Bingo. All right, we're done. And she's like, what, that's it? You don't need to know anything else? I said, no, I'm good. And I thanked her and hung up the phone, called the priest back. And I said, uh, Father Ed, she said she does yoga. And he goes, oh, okay. So he said, I, I couldn't get that out of her. I said, yeah, she was screaming at me. But she just screamed over and over again. I work out. Are you stupid? Are you daft? You know, what's wrong with you? I said, so then I started naming workout regimens or routines she might do where she realized what it is I was actually looking for. And then when she realized that, she said yoga. And um, I said, but she doesn't have any idea that she's done anything wrong. And uh, you know, she doesn't realize that, you know, even, you know, there's so many Catholics that don't know that there's a document that was written by St. Pope John Paul II called Jesus Christ, the water bearer of life. And in there, he describes about 20 practices and says this list is not all inclusive. 
but these are 20 things that no Catholic can do. And one of them is yoga. Yeah, I knew that. And I hadn't known that for many years. And so I, it, anyway, so it's right. People need to know these things. And it is a wonderful gift. It's like the movie, The Sixth Sense. My kids always joke about it. I see dead people. You know, right. you're able to see what we can't see. I'm going to be, you know, Zachary, I would love to interview you like 35 different times because your story okay. is a walking testimony of miracles and interactions with God. So please forgive me if I cut you off at any point, because there's so much oh. I want to jam into this, but I was interested a lot in Eucharistic miracles. And my question's kind of two part. Have you ever, when you lived the life of a Satanist, did you ever take part in any rituals that desecrated the Eucharist? Not that I need to know what you did because I just don't want our Lord desecrated again. But it has been said that Satanists, if you give them a pile of unconsecrated hosts and only one is consecrated, that they can see that. So that's the first half of the question. The second half of the question then would be, um, how do you believe then in Eucharistic miracles and in um how should people, let, let's go with the first one. Let's just go with that. And then I'll come with the second half. Um, I only did, generally the Satanists that do black masses are usually atheistic in nature. So like the Satanic Temple and the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey's Church of Satan, they do black masses. Um, theistic Satanists, not so much. But I got invited to one as kind of like theater. So there's the participants, there's the people actively doing the mass. Then there's the mass goers that is kind of like, so you have like the priest and, and the people on the altar, and then you have the church goers. But then imagine that there's a third group of people that are watching the spectacle of the church goers and the actual mass. Okay. So the, those would be the people that are in like the theater watching the event happen. So I was in the, ch I was the church goer watching the people participating in the black mass and watching what was happening. And, it, and they had to explain every step to me because I had never been to a Catholic mass. So I didn't know that the black mass was an inversion of that. I didn't even know why it was called a black mass. And when they're up there, they eventually pull out what looks like a vanilla wafer. And I said, what's that? And he said, oh, some religions believe that's God. And I started laughing and thought, you know, it's a vanilla wafer. Why, why is that suddenly? Who's worshiping that? As a child, I might have worshiped that. Vanilla wafers, come on, those are good. But couldn't fathom. And then I remembered that, oh, yeah, the Baptist church doesn't remember its ceremony every three months. And if you're a Christian, you're allowed to participate. And they send around uh, their version of a suborum that has uh, these little square pieces of bread that are disgusting. And then they send around another container that has thimbles of grape juice. And then, you know, they say a few words up front on, on their altar. And then you take your piece of bread and drink your grape juice. And, you know, it's a big deal. You know, it's a very important ceremony in the Baptist church, but I mean, ultimately it doesn't mean anything because you're not taking the body and blood of Christ. Right. And, um, you know, it's just their little remembrance ceremony. And so then I remembered that, but you know, that still didn't equate to why are they abusing this vanilla wafer up there? And it, they did a bunch of things to it. And like I said, it was, it, it was pretty horrific when I think back to what they did to it. It was horrific. When I witnessed it, it, it was just confusing. Like, why would you do that? And then in the end, they threw it in a fire. And, you know, I was just perplexed that, you know, you, you're taking something that to an outsider looks like no big deal. It would be like somebody that doesn't know the value of money watching somebody throw a $100 bill in the fire. You know, and as you not know the value of money, What's the big deal about that? But if you know the value of money, you just burned a hundred dollar bill. You know, why would you do that? You know, I didn't know 
that that was Christ up there in the Eucharist that they're abusing. You know, I just assumed that this was just part of the theater. You know, this was part of the, the act. I saw the second time, the second time I didn't have somebody to explain it to me. So it was even more confusing than the first time. And then fast forward 20 or 30 years and I'm at a mass. And five minutes into that mass, I recognized the black mass. And I recognized, you know, oh, <laughs> this makes sense now. Uh, you know, everything they did, it's the opposite of here. Like they did uh, a rosary, they sprayed it all backwards. So hearing it all backwards, I didn't know what they were praying. And it looked like a rosary, but I didn't know what a rosary was. What do you mean they prayed it backwards? Did they, the, the words of the prayers that we prayer. use were backwards? Yeah. Yes. So they still said the Hail Mary, but they said the Hail Mary backwards. Backwards. Wow. They said the Our Father, and I think they said the Glory Be, and they said the Fatima Prayer, but everything was backwards. Wow. So I always, when I have people that question the faith, I always tell them, look into Eucharistic miracles. Look into them. The, the Satan worshipers are not going after, as you just said, the bread in somebody else's church. They right. are going after this. They are stealing tabernacles. They are rec recognizing um, Jesus in that. Do you have that special ability um, that if there were a pile of hosts, would you be able to see which one was consecrated because you said you can see Jesus in the host? Or is it, was it just in the beginning when you well, were first? Yeah, uh, being able to see Jesus was probably in the first one or two years that I was Catholic. I'm guessing that he was just showing me that he was still there and that he was in every church, every Catholic church that I went to. You know, I didn't realize when I first started that there was a traditional Latin rite. I didn't know that there was such a thing. You know, I just knew Novus Ordo and I didn't even know the term Novus Ordo. You know, I just went to mass and it was just a very simple, every church I went to, every Catholic church, I didn't go to any other church, but every Catholic church I went to had the Eucharist and I would see Jesus in all of them, you know? And so, I mean, I, I knew that every place, you know, you may not like the priest, you may not like the homily he gives. It may be boring or, you know, just, you just for whatever reason, you don't like it. You don't like the church. You don't like the people, you know, you know, you, you don't have to like anybody. You're there for Jesus. Yes. And it doesn't matter if the people are friendly to you or not. It doesn't matter if the <laughs> priest gives the shortest most or the longest, most boring homily. You know, if you don't agree with the homily, you don't agree with what he says, you don't like the Bible verse he read, you know, you don't like his interpretation of it. You don't like you cannot like anything. You may not but even But you're like there for what takes place on that altar. You're not there to get, you're there to give, you're there to worship. And there is God on that altar. You know, it's not yeah. like the Protestant, the Protestant church where you can go in and eat a slice of pizza on the back pew, you know, and right. enjoy your cup of coffee. You're not there for any of that. You know, you're there for Christ. Yeah. You know, none of that matters. Your salvation is what is at hand. You know, that is what's important. You know, and you can go up for that, that Eucharist every day, but you better be in a state of grace for it. You know, don't think that's a symbol. If you think it's a symbol, go back to the Baptist church, because there it's a symbol. You know, all the Protestant churches, 66,000 Protestant denominations, they have a symbol. We have the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you are Catholic. Don't forget that. You have the fullness of the truth. You have the, the, the one true church. You have the Eucharist, you know, the, the greatest gifts Christ gave us, his mother, confession, and the Eucharist. You know, you know no other church has that. Right. Apparently, no other church wants it, or they'd all be Catholic. Amen to that. I wanted to ask you some questions specific to... Um, to Satanism, but now with your knowledge that you have as a avowed and a God fearing, loving man, a son of the most high God, uh, a couple of the things is if over my shoulder here, I have, I think 
or let me go this way, right there is the, is the St. Joseph holding Jesus. And it is, he's known as the terror of demons. Mm. Is that true to the best of your knowledge? Of course, I know it's true, but I'm saying based on the lifestyle that you've lived, do Satanists ever fear St. Joseph? Do you ever hear any of that? If that kind of uh, imagery was brought in, just to speak to that, do you know of the influence of some of the saints, specifically his mother or his, his stepfather, Joseph, on on the satanic church rituals or anything? When I was a Satanist, the only thing I knew about Catholics was what my dad had told me when I was eight years old, that all Catholics were going to hell. So I didn't know anything about saints. Um, I knew nothing about the Catholic church. Like, you know, like when that woman gave me the miraculous medal and said, the blessed mother's calling you into her army. I didn't no know who idea. the blessed mother was. You know, my first thoughts were Isis and Gaia. You know, I had no idea who that was. And, you know, the only thing I'd ever, the only interaction with anything Catholic that I remember was years ago, um, we had word that one of our, um, somebody in our coven was going to be exercised. And he was being exercised in his apartment. And it was in the ghetto. This was in Detroit. And it almost looks like a prison when you get there. There's a fence that's about, it seemed to be about 18 feet tall with uh, barbed wire at the top of it. But the gate was open and we drove a van inside and left it. I don't know if you want me to tell this story because. Go uh, ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's about eight of us approximately. Uh, I'm the high wizard and and I'm dressed as the high wizard and we're in the ghetto in Detroit and we're at like um, this housing, this building that's about two stories tall and it's like a, a large apartment complex and there's a row, a long row of apartments and it's about every 20 or 30 feet is a set of stairs that leads up to the second floor. He's on the first floor and his apartment door, when you open it, about six feet in front of his door is a set of stairs that leads up. So it leads up. There's about six stairs that lead up. Then there's a landing. You turn around and then go up another 12 steps and you're on the second floor. So his apartment is on that first floor facing the stairs. And we're trying everything. All we want to do is disrupt the exorcism if we can, to get our friend out of the room and just take him with us. That's the only plan. We're not there to kill the priest or hurt the priest, but we're not going to not hurt the priest if he gets in our way. I mean, we're just going to do whatever it takes to get our friend out. And we can't get to that door. If we walk towards it, there's like a barrier. Like you can't see anything but you can't get close enough to the door. If you're shouting, no matter how loud you yell, it comes out as a whisper. It's like sound will not penetrate. penetrate. Nobody can get to it. So I tell one of the guys, go down to the next set of stairs, go up to the second floor, come down here and come down the stairs and see if that works. So he does that. And he comes down the stairs, and when he rounds the corner to take the last five or six stairs down, he can't take them. He, he, can, he said, there's something here. It's just like when you're on the ground, you can't get to the door. So we've tried throwing things that'll hit the door. There's also a window to see, will it hit the window and break it? I don't care if it breaks it. Just try and get his attention. But anything you throw hits something on the way and drops to the ground. So nothing we can do is getting there. I told one of my guys, go up to the second floor, come down to this spot, hang off the ledge and drop yourself down. You should land right in front of the door. So he does that. Now remember there's eight of us standing there watching this happen. 
he lowers himself down off the top. There's a, a handrail, a metal handrail, and it looks solid. He's, it's not going to break. And he's not heavy enough to, you know, to do anything anyway. He's not really going to get hurt. The most he's going to drop down is about six feet. So he's holding on to this thing and he lets go and he drops down and then he's gone. He disappeared. <gasps> he dropped and pff, he's not there. And we're all like, you know, like, where did he go? You know, it's like he, he, he dropped it. We watched it happen. He dropped down. And when he would have hit this area that nobody can penetrate, nobody can, nothing is getting past, he disappears. Now, it turned out when he reappeared, it was on the roof of the building. Like, he got up there and thought, what, what, what happened to me? You know, it's like I was dropping down to the ground floor, and now suddenly I'm on the second floor above the second floor. You know, he's on top of this building. And... So my guys are trying to figure out, they've got theories on what they can do. I'm practicing magic out there and none of my magic is doing anything. So about 20 feet or 30 feet down from that apartment is an alcove that has two vending machines, a telephone and a chair. I'm going to go sit on that chair while you guys figure out what do you think is happening there? You know, and I'm thinking, you know, it might take, we might have to get a gun or something that'll penetrate, that fire a shot, do something. But you guys figure it out. I'm going to go sit down. I'm hot. You know, the high wizard costume is not a cool feeling. You know, there's no wicking material in there. You're sweating to death under that costume. You know, so, I mean, I've got face paint on. I've got a top hat on. I'm burning up. I'm going to sit in this chair. As I'm sitting there, I notice that the vending machine that used to have food in it doesn't have the plexiglass window in it anymore. That's completely gone. There's no snacks in it. And the, the soda machine is busted up and there's no soda in it either. And the telephone, the drawer where all the money goes, that drawer is busted open and the phone receiver is missing. So there's three machines in that alcove that can't be used. The chair is missing the pad on it, but I don't care. I'm going to sit down. So as I'm sitting there, suddenly seven or six of my guys run past. Like You've never seen people run this fast. This is like, if these people would have been in the Olympics, they'd have won every event. These guys zoom past this little alcove. I mean, it was, it was almost a blur. And the last guy in the back comes back and yells at me, run like hell. And he takes off running again. And I'm thinking... Why? So I walk out to see why are they running away? Now we're running back to the van. The van is parked in the parking lot. And when we got there, you know, they were like, should we lock it up? And I said, no. And they said, you know, we're parked in the ghetto. Somebody's liable to get in here and just steal it. And I said, they can see who we are. No one's going to mess with our vehicle. They'll be too scared to mess with us, which was true. But when I looked to the left to see what are they yelling at? Why are they scared? I see this. To me, it was a monster. It was about 100 feet tall. And it was wearing armor and had a flaming sword. I did not know. I mean, it was an angel. but St. Michael. I imagine it was St. Michael. And... I, my jaw dropped and I knew I had, I had to run quickly and remember that it was a minute ago that all my friends ran past me. I caught up to them. They're running. I catch up to them. You know, I'm holding my hat as I go. I've got a wand or a cane in one hand, my hat in the other, my hair is flapping in the breeze and suddenly I'm up with the other six people. You know, and they're like, oh, you're fast. I was, you know, kidding. And one of them says, we need to head towards the van. And somebody else said, haven't you ever seen all the movies? The people that jump in the car are the first to die. <laughs> you know, so we all left it. We ran into the neighborhood. 
you know, it, I, you know, they're like, you know, we're in the ghetto. I don't care. So we all run, you know, it's, I'm not going to die by whatever this giant thing is. That's got a flaming sword that that giant sword is much bigger than me. You know, I don't need to, to contend with that. So I run into this neighborhood with everybody else. We all split up. I was in that neighborhood for about three hours. Wow. I'm just walking around. Everybody that sees me either nods to me or goes across the street. They, they either have a lot of respect for me. I've never been there. I've never been in this, in this neighborhood before. I don't recognize any of these people. One of the guys that came up to me asked me if I was hungry or needed anything to drink. And I said, yes, I would appreciate that. So he took me to his mama's house. And like, like I said, we were in the ghetto. He was very respectful. And I guess he was a leader. He was a gangbanger. And he was the leader of some big gang. And he took me to his mama's house. So his mama would feed me and give me something to drink. And she was very nice, very polite. And they never said, we know you're the high wizard. But did they know? Yeah, they seemed to know. They seemed, they seemed to know exactly who I was. And this guy walked with me everywhere. When I left his house, he said that he would keep me safe. He says, I know you don't, I know, I know you don't need to be kept safe. He said, but yeah, I want to do this. So he walked with me while I just walked around the neighborhood. I was waiting to be picked up. And, you know, this is before cell phones, so I couldn't just call somebody to come pick me up. And finally, my van pulled up and all the guys were in it. And I turned around. We used to keep these uh, gold coins on us. On one side of it is a top hat with a wand or a cane that goes across it. And on the other side, it says HW. And I pulled out the gold coin and gave it to this guy. And he thanked me. And I said, do you know what that is? He says, I very much, I do. He said, I'm very happy to get this. If the high wizard gives somebody the gold coin, they can go to any high wizard and get whatever their desire is. If they want a magic spell or they want something done. All they have to do is request it. If you've got the gold coin, that gives you this request. So, you know, it's like a special token. And so I gave him one of those. And, you know, I told him, you know, if you want, hey, you know, could you give this one to your mother? And he said, she won't take it. She's a good Christian woman. I was like, okay, fair enough. So I got in the van and we drove away. And everybody in the van had the same story about what they saw. This giant thing that they thought was an angel. And, you know, the flaming sword and the armor. And they all thought he was there to kill us. Now, we thought maybe he wasn't there to kill us, maybe to scare us, because if he wanted to kill us, Good. he could have easily done it. But he knew that you, it wasn't your time, either by natural knowledge or the Lord had told him, don't, because at least one of you in that group was one day going to become a Catholic missionary, Catholic evangelist, you know, so if you had died then, you'd have gone to hell, but... I mean, that's just amazing. And it, it, you know, it doesn't even surprise me at all. It just, everything I've heard, everything I've learned, some people watching this show would go, these people are nutcases. This can't really happen. But when you have faith in God and you know, angels and demons both exist, how can we doubt? How can we doubt? We have that prayer at the mass that in the beginning of it says, in everything visible and invisible. Yes. It's like, what do you think that prayer refers to? Right. You know, what, right. what is there that's invisible that you don't see? You know, what do you think is there? Yeah. You know, Padre Pio said that if you could see with spiritual eyes, there's enough demons to block out the sun. Yeah. He said if they stood shoulder to shoulder, they would eclipse all light. I mean, that's a lot. Have you ever seen them? Uh, because yes. you, so what does that when when mean? I When I was a high wizard, I had the, I thought it was my gift that I could see demons and angels. And at that time, I thought that the demons were there to keep me safe and the angels were there to do me harm. It wasn't until after I was Catholic 
Is that I realized true? that the angels were there to keep me safe and the demons were there to keep me damned. You know? I saw a demon once um, for the sake of privacy. I'm not going to say because this person uh, around whom I've seen it hadn't doesn't know yet the story. Uh, but I wasn't able to see his face, but I could see that it was Satan. And um, do you, could, do you, if people say to you, what does he look like? Is it similar to that where you can just sense the evil? You can see the darkness, but you can't make out all the features or was it much clearer than that to you? And the same with the angels, were they clear? You could see faces, you could see light. Angels are, it's like a holy light. It's like a light that is so white, you've never seen a light like that before. Yeah. There's no light bulb in the world that shines like that. I mean, if I could turn that light bulb on in my house, it would illuminate every room, even rooms that it wasn't in. You wouldn't be blind anymore. Right. And I wouldn't be <laughs> blind. Anymore. I could see perfect. Um, there was a girl, when I met her, her name was uh, Christina Wood. And now her name is sister mary crown of purity she goes by the name sister purity obviously she's a nun but before she was a nun i was in i was in church i was in saint Raphael catholic church in winus or not winuski in lehigh acres florida and my wife is standing beside me and i i'm all of a sudden i'm looking around the room she says what are you looking for i said somebody holy is coming our way I can see their light. I can see the light of the Holy Spirit. It, and to me, the room was darkened, except for that. That holy light was coming closer to me. And it was coming from my left. And I was just like, I just wanted to see who has that. Who is that person? And that person was about 13 or 14 years old. And her name was Christina. And she had such a quality of holiness about her, you know, and she knew she was going to be a nun when she was nine years old. She knew that there was no reason to ever date. There was no boy that would ever have hold her interest because all she wanted to do was become a nun. And now she's been, I don't know if she's taken her final vows yet. She went in when she was about 19 and she's probably close to 24 years old now. And, you know, she, she is, you know, to me, all nuns are beautiful, mm. whether you're young or old, short, you know, tall, heavy, light, skinny, whatever you are, no matter what color you are, or I refer to as flavor, no matter what flavor you are, all nuns are beautiful. Even the, the older ones that seem cantankerous, <laughs> are looking for your salvation yeah all of them love you in their own way ah uh, you know, Zachary like, do you still see do you still see the light in holy people when they walk past you because you made me yes. want to cry I thought yes I would love there's, that to me there's a greatest compliment if you would say I see a light around you I that's what I want that, that I, I can't do it on a laptop I well, yeah, no, I wasn't trying to publicly say, tell me, am I holy? But I was saying, you know, rhetorically, that's the greatest compliment anyone could get, I think. I, I've spoken in Brazil. I've gone to Brazil twice. And both times I spoke multiple times. Like my smallest talk, well, I did a, a talk in a prison. And that was, you know, that, that's a, a limited audience. You know, they're not bringing people in just to see you. Right. So... You know, that was probably about 40 or 50 people. And I did a talk in a school and that was about 50 people. But other than that, my smallest talk was probably 1500 people. And I've had one of my talks was around 6,000. And one of the places that the, the first place that hosted me when I was there was this monastery, uh, the Hesed Institute. And the Hesed Institute is 187 nuns, uh, a couple of priests, and some seminarians. And one of my talks, you know, I was blind when I was there, and this was in 2016. And I was at, I had an interpreter that walked with me, Brother Emmanuel. And I said, 
who was standing next to me, just to my left. She stood there for a minute, but she wasn't talking to me. And he says, why do you ask? And I said, because she was such holiness. There was this bright light all around her. And it was like, that was white. But up above her was a blue light shining down on her. And it was just like, if I could have just grabbed onto her and held on so that I could get some of that, even if it doesn't come from me, I just wanted it on me. You know, I just wanted to be in the presence of somebody holy and to be that holy and to be that close to them, you know, and whatever, you know, it's like, can, can I climb up on their back and can, can they carry, <laughs> right. you know, what, what can happen here? What, what can we do to, to facilitate this? And he laughed and he said, that's the mother superior. She's over the convent. And I said, oh, you're so lucky to have somebody that holy in your miss. And he says, she will not find it that way. If I tell her that, that she will probably die of embarrassment. So she does not see herself as holy. She just sees herself as she has a job to do. You know, and this is what she does. But, you know, when I first, when I first went there, they took me to their adoration chapel which is, it's indoor, you know, it's, there's a roof and a back wall and, and side walls and all that. But the front wall is a screen. It's like mesh. So that you, there's no air conditioning. So, you know, you can get fresh air while you're sitting in there, but you know, you're not under the elements. And I was sitting there in, in the Adoration Chapel and I noticed behind the monstrance was a sign on the wall. It's written in Portuguese, so I have no idea what it says, but it seems to have my name in it. It looks like it says Zachary King. And I said, um, that sign on the wall. And Brother Emmanuel says, ah, you think you see your name? And I said, yes, it looks like Zachary King. And he, he laughed and he said, yes. He says, let me tell you a story. He said, we hired you, you know, we contacted you and decided, yes, you're who we want to come and speak, you know, at multiple venues. And then they have a nun that's been there for, I don't know, 20 years or however long she's been there. But she was walking down the stairs, felt like she was pushed. And I, I, if I got the story correct, I think she twisted her ankle really bad. And one of the seminarians that's been there a while, and he goes up and down the stairs almost every day, um, either sprained or broke his wrist. And then they found, now you have to understand that this complex is really big and there's this fence that goes all the way around it that's probably, I'm gonna guess about 12 to 15 feet high. And it's got barbed wire on the top of it. And they're not trying to keep the nuns and the priests in, they're trying to keep, they're surrounded by uh, three really large Santeria cults. And so they're trying to keep the bad people out. And so they found a dead cat that had been skinned and was in the center of the complex, too far away from somebody to have thrown it from the outside and have it land here. No one could have done that. And it was dead before it came into the yard. I mean, it was skinned. So it didn't walk there and die. So how did it get there? And they figured that that was the devil threatening them. So they called a meeting and asked, you know, everybody that's there, why do you think this is happening? Like we've had two injuries, the dead cat, weird stuff is happening. Why is this happening? And somebody raised their hand and said, I think it's because you hired Zachary King. I think the devil is telling us you know, that he'll stop all this if we call him back and tell him not to come. And so the mother superior said, how many other people agree with that assessment? And with what she says about, is this the devil? Everybody raised their hand. They agreed this was the devil. And she said, what do you think we should do about it? And one of the priests said, I think we should increase our prayers 
for Zachary King and still bring him. Obviously, if the devil doesn't want him here. He's got a great message. Yeah, we should absolutely bring him. So they agreed and they made this sign and they put it inside the adoration chapel behind the monstrance that ask everybody that comes in, which they have 187 members. So they clearly have 24 hours a day, seven days a week covered. Everybody that comes in, you can pray about anything you want to for your hour that you're there, but you also have to include a prayer for me. And then the other plus of that to me is that look who my name is sitting right in front of. The king. I'm sitting right in front of Jesus. You know, it's like, how better, how much better can this get? You know, this can't get any better to me. You know, it's like, so my name is right in front of Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I have 187 people praying for me every week, praying my name to Jesus. I'm like, I win. This is, this is incredible. Yeah. So when I got there, I got that story. And he says, are you happy to be here? I said, I'm happy about the whole situation. I said, I got, you know, prayers from all you guys. I mean, I have, I have those prayers every day. I have somebody donated money to some cloistered nuns, 22 cloistered nuns in Pennsylvania that pray rosaries for me every day. I have, um, there's uh, a convent on a mountain in St. Maximum de St. Baum, France. I went there and spoke in 2014 and that convent prays for me every day. You know, I have people around the world that pray for me every day. I talk to people on the phone every day that tell me that they offer their rosaries for me. I have people that say I have multiple masses every day being said for me. Wow. I have um, new people that I meet that say that they'll pray for me. I have a lot of people that say, you know, you pray for me, I'll pray for you. I have a lot of deals like that with a lot of people, you know, and I'm under, I mean, my satanic attacks, some days I don't even see the end of the tunnel. <laughs> There's no light. So in you're here. leading into my next questions, my next set of questions. Um, for our viewers, you've probably been picking up as he's been speaking. Zachary King was a satanic high wizard uh, in Satanism for 26 years, I believe. Yes. And he could see fine. His health was fine. And since he has given his life to the Lord, he has lost his sight. He has diabetes. You are getting transfused every week. And you and I spoke privately. I forgot to ask if it's okay to say this, but knowing you, everything's okay. That's yeah. Is that the satanic attacks do not stop. They are incessant. Um, speak about that. Speak about when these things started happening. Did you recognize, when, when did you recognize that, you know what, this is Satan trying to stop me? And how is your spirit about that? Is it more of a, I will receive this to make amends for my the sins of my pastor. So kind of speak to how we should understand. And because the second half of my question is going to be leading towards all of the people that I work with every day, maybe people you work with that are suffering. And I kind of talk to them about the value of their suffering. So you take us to when these things started happening and when you recognize them as uh, for what they are. I think it was... Um... I had not been, I wasn't officially in the church yet. You know, it was between being given the medal and entering the church. I was given the medal in January of 08, and I officially came into the church in May of 08. And, but in between, like, I went to daily mass. Now, to bring a, a little levity to the, the, the program here, I found out that there's a such thing as Catholic etiquette. I didn't know anything about Catholic etiquette. I went to daily mass, but I was a manager of a store. So I couldn't go to mass on Sunday because that's my day. I work at the store alone on Sunday. So I could be there and I couldn't be there Saturday afternoon. So I would miss the obligatory mass late Saturday afternoon and Sunday, but I could go Saturday morning and I could go Monday. The weekdays. 
all through the weekdays I went. And, but all the people I'm seeing, we have one woman that's probably in her twenties and she has a daughter that's about two years old. Everyone else is the blue hair bunch. It's like when all these people die, there'll be nobody to replace them. But that one two year old. <laughs> but that one two year old and her mother. So, but all these people, it, it's like the average age is about 75. And so me and that two year old are setting off the age limit, you know, the age average. So I'm going to mass every day, every day, every day, every day. And these are the only people I see. And, you know, there's about 25 people in the morning for all these masses. The first time I got to go to Sunday mass, the parking lot was packed. <laughs> like I went inside the church. It's a big church. It's St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church in Winooski, Vermont. And it, I don't know how many people it holds, but on Sunday, it, there's no room for anybody else to come in. You know, if you're late, it's standing room only. And it's packed. And me and my wife go in and we find a place to sit. And the mass happens and it, it follows a little different decorum and procedure than the daily mass does. You know, but I reckon it's Sunday. It's a bigger service. You know, you got to do right. things originally. I get that. And at the sign of peace, everybody gets up and everybody's greeting everybody. This is obviously pre-COVID. And everybody's, some people are walking around the room shaking hands. And this guy comes up to me, big smile on his face. And this is where I learned about Catholic etiquette. He said, hey, brother. I've never seen you here. I come here every Sunday and he shakes my hand. He's so happy to see me. And I said, I go to daily mass. I've never seen you there either. <laughs> and all of a sudden. Oh, he, he lost the smile off his face. He lost his smile. He pulled his hand back and he turned around, kind of walked away looking defeated. And I thought, don't say that again. <laughs> Keep that inside. You know, certain things you don't say, that's probably one of them. Oh, that's so funny. I didn't realize that was, you know, he just said he never saw me there. So why can't I say I've never seen you there either? That's funny. So when did you start losing your sight? When did things start happening? And were you quickly aware that it was Satan that was attacking you? Or what was it that was, like? Um, it was 2012. And it was actually, I'm not positive that it was Satan. Because okay. the day before my retina is detached. I said, I don't, I don't, this isn't a story that I broadcast around the world. So some places have heard this story, but not many. You know, I can probably count on one hand how many times I've told this story, um, except to private people sometimes, but I don't broadcast it on shows like this. Well, then I'm honored. Um, I prayed to God one day, somebody sent me an email, you know, I get, I used to get about 200 ministry emails a day. Now I get a little less. Praise God, I get a little less because it's hard to keep up with that. Um, me and my, my secretary's name is Kristen. And previous to last Saturday, for about two months, we've been working on 3,700 emails because I didn't have a secretary for a while. And I was working, I had all the 3,700 emails to catch up on. Saturday, we brought it down to zero. And then when I went in, I work on my emails Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday while I'm at dialysis. And Tuesday, when I went in, we had 87 emails. So thankfully, because I was fearing I was going to have 600 because, you know, I used to get 200 a day. So I got this email back in 2012, and it said that it appeared as though I was arrogant that when I answer questions or I, I'm at my talks or even when I answer email, that I seem arrogant. And I asked my wife, "Do I am I arrogant? And she said, no. And I called around. I, I asked a bunch of my friends and priests. And I mean, I took a survey. You know, it was about 100 people. And everybody said no. But I prayed about it. And I said, you know, I don't want to appear arrogant. I apparently, I don't want to be arrogant, but I don't want to appear arrogant. You know, I, I realize that when you come see me at a talk, 
a lot of times there's nobody else there. Right. It's just me. So obviously these 1500 people are there to see me and it's my message. They're there. They're there to see. I have the expertise. You're there to hear what I have to say, but I'm not arrogant about that. I recognize that, you know, I've been told by, I, I can't tell you how many people, I will say thousands, but I don't know that I'm the leading expert in my topic. Okay. But I'm not arrogant about that. Right. You know, to, to become, yeah, to become that expert, I had to be in Satanism for 26 years. Yeah. You know, I had to be a bad person for over 26 years to become that expert. So that's not coming from a place of arrogance. Right. Nowadays, that's really a place of humility. You know, I didn't get to be Catholic like a lot of people their entire lives. You know, I've only been Catholic for, well, like the last 13 years or so. You know, I would have loved to have grown up Catholic. You know, finding out that Jesus was legitimately in the Catholic Church was the greatest day of my life. You know, that that was the best kept secret from me of all time. And finding out that that was legit. Oh, you know, I if I'd have known that as a kid, you couldn't have drugged me out of the Catholic Church. Can I you stop had... you right there? I, I, I want to look directly into the camera and I want to talk to everyone listening that heard what you just said. I am 56 years old. I am a cradle Catholic. I have had that privilege, Zachary. I have... I remember my first communion as an eight-year-old girl, and no arrogance here, but I'm telling you my truth, is that I didn't, I, sure, the dress was pretty and I loved all the party stuff, but I remembered sitting down, receiving our Lord on my tongue and sitting down and, get, and I, when I kneeled, when I knelt down, I said, I have Jesus in my tummy. And the awe that hit me as an eight-year-old girl and so again this is not about me but i want to fast forward when covid came and i am a regular mass goer i go every sunday i don't want to miss sundays i'd be one of those that you would say oh she's a good catholic all that stuff and when covid shut the churches when our bishops chose the shut to shut the churches and i in virginia i'm actually blessed that ours opened up relatively soon they were shut down in march and they opened up the last day of may I remember getting on my knees in my living room and thinking how much I had taken for granted that. Exactly. And it was, our church opened up May 24th, I believe, of last year. And that weekend I had to go down to Florida and I was so looking forward to going to mass. And when I got there, I found out that Florida wasn't opening their, their churches yet. And I just said to my husband, I have to be at the church. I have to be at the church. And I had an ugly cry. I snot rolling down my face. And I went to the door. I said, let's go watch mass on our phones in front of the church. We went to the church and I just pressed my face against the glass and I looked in and Jesus was like so close but so far. And I sobbed and I said, Lord, I will never take you for granted again. Don't let me take you for granted again. And so the next week I was able to receive the Lord and it was so sweet and I sobbed when he was on my tongue for the first time and though I vowed I would never take him for granted just listening to you I'm already more accustomed to it again than I was on that Sunday when the Lord said I will withhold if you don't appreciate me he didn't specifically say that but that's what I felt and so I'm looking at everyone listening say let's listen to what Zachary King says we have the privilege of receiving our Lord, most of us, many of us, uh, uh, every week. I know that there's some people in Ireland, the churches haven't even been opened yet, God help us. Um, but for those of you where the Eucharist is available, know what it is, know who it is, and don't put anything in front of the King on the altar. And Zachary, thank you so much for reminding me that I have some invaluable, inestimable gift of our God every day. So, you know, what you lacked has become a blessing for us. So I appreciate those words. It was last year when COVID kicked in and the quarantine and all the churches shut down. To me, I felt like 
Now, I might get in trouble for saying this, but I thought that the church is shut down because of a lack of belief in the true presence. I agree. If you legitimately believe that's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus is not going to give anybody COVID. Right. You know, and all the churches shut down. Why don't you believe that that's Christ? Like, why, you know, what, there, you know, the, the, the thing, this is what boggles my mind. Do you know who stayed open during that time? Protestant churches. Sure, and abortion they clinics. Have, they don't have the body and blood of Christ. They don't have the body and blood of Christ, but they have the faith to keep their doors open. Yeah. We have the body and blood of Christ. We, we shut our, door. our doors. Oh, wrong? we could do a whole show on that. Um, we, we maybe, but I do want to keep us going because you and I see our blood will just go up like, ah, but <laughs> this is supposed to be, you know, an exciting show to see what the Lord has done with you. So you've been out of Satanism now for what? That was 2004. So uh, 2008, 2008. January, January, so 2008. 13 years, as you said, um, I wanted to ask you another question. Well, I, before I do okay, that. Yes, please finish how I went blind. Oh, and gosh. Why I think it might be a God thing. I was praying and I said, okay, I've been told that I'm arrogant. I don't feel that I am. I granted, I, I did the, the American thing and took a survey. <laughs> I, I acted like I was on family feud and I took a survey. 100 people surveyed is Zach arrogant. And the consensus is no, that it's just this one guy. And I get that Sometimes the most well-intentioned person is a tool of the devil. You know, they mean well, but the devil like plants a thought in their head and they can't shake it. And they decide they're going to say something about it. And they do. And sometimes they tell multiple people about it being well-intentioned, thinking that they are heading down the correct path and they're holding the devil's hand the whole time, you know, and the devil, they're there being serious and stoic. And I just want to give this message, just the facts. And this is what I think is happening. And the devil's doing a jig next to them going, you know, they're doing my bidding. Here we go. You know, so maybe this person was doing that. Maybe they were legitimately thinking I was arrogant. Maybe on that day they saw me. Maybe I sounded arrogant. I don't know. Cause I never try and sound that way, but they said it. I prayed to God about it. And I said, could you help me to become humble? But remember, I am American. I said, could you not do it in the way you do everything else? Like, I know never to ask for patience. <laughs> yeah, because you have to wait 1200 years for it. Oh my gosh, God will try you. Like, I mean, you'll be losing your mind, you'll be pulling your hair out, you know. Why did I pray for this? That's right. You know, I'm crying every day about, I can't take this. Stop. Take away my patience. I know I don't want to be patient anymore. Like, too late. You done prayed for it. He's going to make you patient. Yeah. Help hurt. me be humble, but do it in a way that doesn't humiliate me, right? Right, right. You know, something like that. You know, can you make me chase, but just not yet? Um, <laughs> you know, it's like all these little prayers that we do, you know, because we're negotiators. That, that's our country. We, we negotiate everything. We'll say yes to it eventually, but we want to negotiate the outcome first. Right. So I said, you know, I, I want to be humble. I don't want anyone to ever accuse me of being arrogant again. I want humility, but couldn't you like ease me into it? Oh. Like not, don't just slap me upside the head with be humble. Right. You know, it's like, no, I don't want that. I, I just want to ease my way into it. And the very next day, both my retinas detached. And if you think being blind is not a humble experience, mm. I've had to go, I've had to use the bathroom at a rest stop. You know, you're traveling, you gotta go. Not all rest stops have a family bathroom. Now in a family bathroom, for those of you that don't travel, a family bathroom means the entire family can go in that bathroom at the same time. It's not, you know, men in this one, women in this one, right. family bathroom, anybody can go in there. You know, you can walk in that bathroom with your kids and your wife or your spouse. You know, everybody goes in at the same time. 
And they you had. didn't have one of those and you had to go into the men's room. I had to go into the men's room. I couldn't go into the women's. And I had to wait for a man to either come out or come in that could lead me to where I needed to go. And we're waiting. Nobody came out. We were there for like 15 minutes. And we watch this giant Harley hog pull up. Oh. And this guy gets off. And this guy has arms up here bigger than my thighs. <laughs> He's got on a vest, a shirt, a coat. A coat is, uh, the jacket is under the vest. And he's got his gang stuff on it. He's wearing a do-rag, but it looks like he's probably bald. And he's got this big biker beard down to his waist. My dad would have described him as Mr. Five by Five because he was five <laughs> foot tall and five feet wide. Right. He's wearing uh, jeans and chaps over that and boots. And he's waddling up. And he looks like, although I'm describing him, this may sound amusing, he looks like he could beat you to death. He could beat up anybody and beat them to death right. and just walk away like nothing happened. And you had to ask him for help. That's who I've got to ask for help because he's the only guy coming up there. And my wife says when he's almost to us, he's looking down, you know, he's not making eye contact. And she says, excuse me, kind sir. And he looks up, his eyes are twinkling and he has a big smile on his face and he says, yes, ma'am, what can I help you with? And she said, could you help my husband into the bathroom? You know, I can't go in because I'm a woman. It's a men's room. And he's like, certainly. And so he has me put my hand on his arm in a place like you're the, the, the right, like a woman would hold a man's arm or like the way you're supposed to lead a blind person. Oh, right. And so I do that. My hand goes on the inside under his arm. And when he leads me in, you know, he, he asked me, you know, where I needed to go, what I needed to use. So I told him what I needed to do. And he leads me to the stall. He enters first, checks everything, puts the seat down, uh, tells me where everything is. And then he tells me that when he's done, he's going to stand right by the door and wait for me. And I said, well, I've been on the road for about six hours. This might take a minute. And he goes, take your time. He goes, I got no place to be. Aww. If I go to the bathroom, I'm there for probably 20 minutes. When I come out, I open the door. He's standing right there. And, you know, I, I thanked him for waiting. He goes, not a problem. And then he takes me to the sink so I can wash my hands. He helps me dry them. And I said, I really appreciate you waiting for me like that. And he said, my grandmother's blind. And if somebody led her to the bathroom and didn't wait, there'd be words. <laughs> there'd be serious words. He said, I know better. He said, I was raised right. And so he leads me outside to my wife. And before I wanted to tell him that I would pray for him. So... But before I say that, he says, I'll be praying for you tonight. Aww. And I said, I'll pray for you too. And I pulled out, you know, I wear a rosary around my neck. I said, I will pray my rosary for you tonight. And he pulls his rosary out of his pocket and says, back at you, buddy. Aww. And he goes to his bike and gets on it and rides away. And my wife was like, how was that experience? I said, that was amazing. I wish I could run into that guy at every bathroom. I mean, he was incredibly helpful. And that is humility. And you're right. So maybe these these crosses you're carrying are from the Lord. Um, and You know, but everything that I get, no matter who it comes from, you know, if the devil is, the devil attacks me in other ways. But to me, you know, I tell people not to fear the biggest idiot in the room. And to me, the devil is the biggest idiot in the room. I mean, he had salvation in his hands. Yeah, he was in heaven. You know, it's like, you took this and threw it away? You're the biggest idiot in the room. So, you know, but everything he does to me, I offer up. You want to keep attacking me? Keep attacking me. I'm offering it up. You know, it's like, you want to prevent souls from going to heaven? 
but you keep attacking me, I'm going to keep offering it up and bringing souls to heaven. You are the biggest idiot in the room because you keep attacking me and I keep offering it up. Is this working for you? Is this your goal? Is this what you intended to do? You know, it's like, is this making you happy? Because if, if making you happy is it, I'm, I'm bringing as many souls with me as I can. You know, good luck with that. You know, and he doesn't stop. He keeps attacking. Well, you know, all angels and demons do, well, once they commit to something, that's all they know. If an angel is told to guard something, he's going to guard it until Jesus tells him not to. Because guarding that object is all he knows to do. Right. If the devil tells one of his demons to attack you, he's going to keep attacking you until the devil tells him not to, because that's what he knows to do. So the devil hates me and attacks me almost daily because that's what he knows to do. He can't stop. He's like the, the, the high wizard that's addicted to magic. He can't stop. So he keeps attacking. I keep offering it up. He keeps attacking. I keep bringing souls to God. He keeps attacking. I'm winning souls for the kingdom. You know, no matter what he does, you know, sometimes the attack gets heavy. Sometimes it's not nice. Sometimes you lose friends over it. You, you feel like you lose your community. You know, it, it, it does seem like torture at times, but you know the end result. You know what happens in the end. If I got to suffer between now and the end, then that's fine yeah. because in the end, I'm going to be in heaven, Lord willing. <laughs> He's going to make it to purgatory. I'm going to have a lot less time in purgatory, though, just for those of you that wonder why I make that comment. Um, during the Jubilee Year of Mercy 2016, we had this thing called Mercy Doors. And Mercy Doors, if you could make it through a set of Mercy Doors, that eliminated all your purgatory time from that time on back for all the sins you committed up until that point. So I went through seven sets of Mercy Doors during that year. Praise God. So I don't have to go to purgatory for all the stuff I did prior to 2016, which is pretty darn incredible because that's when the majority of my sin took place. What a mercy. What a mercy. I tell you what was incredible to me too. To me, almost everything I do, and this is almost everything. If I leave the house, to say if I decide to leave the house today, but for some reason, I'm not able to go today. Maybe 10 things get in my way and I can't leave the house today. So I go tomorrow instead. When I go tomorrow, I run into three people that enhance my life that I would not have seen yesterday. Like the day before. That's right. right. Wow. But that it, is so good that way. It, it's like so much stuff happens that way. It's just like, wow. You know, like, like it just, it, it blows me away that God's timing is so much better than ours. You know, it, it it's just, it's just, a, it blows me away. And really there's is. so much stuff like that. And looking at God's timing, uh, we've been on the air almost an hour and a half, and I could keep talking forever, but for the sake of our viewers, I'm going to try to wrap it up. I just want to ask you, well, there's a couple, several more questions I would ask you, so maybe could we do this again? <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know if I like talking to you that much. I know, I know. Oh, no, I have a whole list of questions that I'm looking at about marriage and divorce and Satan's uh, influence on that. I'm, you know, should we fear the devil? And then, you know, the Latin language. I've heard from Jesse Romero and Father Ripperger, the exorcist, that demons mm -hmm. hate the Latin language. I mean, right. so, actually, right. can I give well, you that one be our last question before I kind of start? They hate the, the Latin language because it's the official language of the church. So a lot of Protestants don't get tradition because their church isn't old enough to have tradition. The oldest Protestant denomination is 504 years old. Right. You know, whereas our church is, what, 17 years away from being 2,000 years old? Yes. So, you know, there's, we have tradition, we have things that started almost 2,000 years ago that we still do. 
our mass, our first mass was done by Jesus. Yes. You know, it's like, there's just, there's so much stuff that we have. We have the fullness of the truth. And in, in having, you know, the original exorcisms were done in Latin and it has the weight, you know, you have 2000 years of weight behind it. Yeah. You know, the, the demons under most demons understand Latin. Some do not. Uh, not every demon knows every language. There are some stupid demons out there that, that can't speak every language. I've been at a lot of exorcisms. We had a demon that couldn't understand Latin. Um, but, you know, it, it, having the weight of the church, you know, a lot, also a lot of Protestants don't understand. Like, I get told, you know, well, Jesus performed exorcisms in the Bible. And, it, and because of that, they think everybody can do it. I said, you know, Jesus was God, right? You do know that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, that, that, that's a, an actual, that's a fact there. And, you know, yes, God can do exorcisms, but you can't. You know, you have to, if you want to do an exorcism, you've got to fall into apostolic succession. And if you can get into that apostolic succession and get permission from your bishop, you can be the exorcist. And you have to get permission for every exorcism you do. It's not just any priest can just walk up and do an exorcism. Right. You know, there's rules, you know, and Protestants don't understand that. A you lot know, of Catholics don't understand that. And uh, that's uh, part uh, of what we need to do is catechize right. one another. Yeah. Right. Right. There's, there's a lack of good formation in our church a lot of times. And there's RCIA programs that are heretical. There's people... Um, Oh, I'm trying to think that I had an example. It was something that I said at a talk. I was in New Zealand and it was something about, it was something about Jesus. Oh, it was the, the prayer we do where he descended into hell on the third day. He rose again in accordance with the scriptures. Right. The Nicene and, Creed. Nicene Creed. And I was thinking of the Nicene Creed or the, the there's an apostles a, creed. The apostles creed. Right. And um, he said that he doesn't believe that Jesus descended into hell. I said, it says it in that prayer. And he says, yeah, but I don't, I don't believe that prayer. Because really, how many other things that are Catholic don't you believe? Anything in the Bible you don't believe? He said, I don't believe in hell. I said, really? Because Jesus spoke on that more than anything else. So I guess Jesus is a liar too. And since it mentions hell in the Bible 93 times, I guess the Bible is incorrect or are they lying? Which way does that go? Is it wrong or are they lying? And he says, well, I don't believe they're wrong and they're lying. I just don't believe in hell. Then As you don't believe the Bible. believe the Bible. You know, and it, it turned into the priest came out and was standing basically behind him as he's going on and on and on about all the things he doesn't believe. And the priest told him that he needed to go back to RCIA and he said he learned that in our CIA. Good. I hope he and, took him seriously and did it. And the he enrolled that man in a different RCIA program. And then he called the leaders of his RCIA program and found out that they were teaching that basically hell was a belief. You don't have to believe in it if you don't want to. And there was a lot of things that they were teaching like that. So he had to take those people and re-educate them. You know, these are not beliefs. Right. And that's what I think we need to do now. I think that's part of what you and I are doing. And a lot of these Catholic podcasters that have popped up, I see, you know, Taylor Marshall, uh, various people just trying to teach the faith. And I think we need to do that. Uh, love the Lord, teach the faith. What you're doing, uh, you know, my kind of ending question to you is what is your mission? What do you think is your mission on earth? I think, I think I have more than one. I think my main mission um, is spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. and, and, but I don't just teach you, I teach you to fight in spiritual warfare. You know, like I tell people, I learned as a kid, being a victim of bullying, not hitting the bully back doesn't stop him from hitting you. That's right. So you can bury your head in the sand if you want to, but the devil's going to continue to beat you till you're you're dead. You know he's going to beat you until you die. He may even be the reason you die. But you know you need to fight. You need. He started attacking you 
the moment he realized your mom was pregnant. That's right. So and your first mission is, for the sake of time, your first mission is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. I, I would like to end abortion around the world. You know, so far, my ministry, allsaintsministry.org is my website. We have shut down 49 abortion clinics around the world. Oh, the goodness. average abortion clinic, according to Planned Parenthood, the average abortion clinic does 1,500 abortions a year. So you take 1,500 times 49 every year. I'm pretty happy with that, but I'd be even happier. I'd be happier if one more shut down. Yes. You know, if I could get them all, you know, if I could be on Planned Parenthood's most wanted list. You probably most, are. <laughs> uh, well, you know, they come up with one every year. They come out with somebody that's that's on their you know, their hit list for that year. I haven't been on it yet, I don't think. Not the official list, but, you know, that's my goal. Oh, that would be awesome. Um, name one thing you would have our listeners do differently as a result of something they heard today. Go to confession before you take the Eucharist. You know, I talk to people that go to confession once a year. If you can go the full year without sinning, praise God, but I cannot do that. And I suspect that you cannot either. We have an examination of conscience form on our website. It's in a PDF. Get it, you know, print it, look at it. The first time I saw an examination of conscience form, I was shocked. I did not know. I went to confession to confess one thing. Found out, found out examination of conscience form, found out that I had 34 sins. Uh. I had no idea I had those extra 34 sins. You know, it's like it, you may be sinning and not realize it. You may be doing something that you don't realize is a sin. You need to go find out if that's the case, and then you need to confess it. You know, I'm not opposed to you taking the Eucharist every day because that's a major chunk of your armor. You need that. But if you're make taking, sure you're worthy. Yeah, make sure you're worthy. Make sure you're not the the wine clap, you know, uh, cask that's going to burst when you put the fresh wine in it. You know, you can only be in a place that's sin free and you need that to be you. And for that to be you, you've got to go to confession. Oh, well, there's so much I would love to ask you and maybe you and I will get another opportunity, but I just want to thank you for, for the life that you have transformed and that you are so public about your sins and then public about your spiritual warfare. I'm here to fight and I will fight till the day I die. And anybody who hears you or hears this show, I think can tell that you are that fighting spirit. No, but you, you don't seem mean. You don't seem callous. You just seem, you know, direct. And this is what Jesus wants. And fighting doesn't mean you have to be mean or ugly or callous, just have to be strong in the Lord. So and willing. Um, what, what was that? Willing. And yeah. willing, yes, just be willing. Um, uh, Zachary, you, you're a blessing to me. You're a blessing to my listeners and my viewers. And I, I will say, I, I've still got a rosary to say today. Um, I will say, keep you on my rosary. And I Thank will you. also say a chaplet of divine mercy just for you, the whole chaplet. Thank you. Um, for each of you watching, I would like to direct you to, what's your website again? AllSaintsMinistry.org. All Yep. allsaintsministry.org there you can get in touch with Zachary King the work he's doing around the world and see if there's any way that you can connect with his ministry bring him into your church bring him into your place of worship to speak educate yourselves educate the people in your lives uh, the Lord has given him this mission the Lord loves him dearly and knows knew when he was going through those dark years that his heart was going to turn towards the Lord. If you forget all of that, just you know, share this video with friends. Come go to my website, breakfastwithbacon.com, and you can listen to the part one of this interview and every other interview uh, that is on there because the Lord has blessed me with amazing uh, men and women with great testimonies. But for now, we need to kind of log off. So I bet you don't remember how we end the show, do you? I don't. I'm sorry. Ah. I forgot to tell you. Well, I'm going to do it myself. To each and every one of you, thank you so much for listening to Breakfast with Bacon and those of you listening on Radio Maria, C-Max TV, and Queen of Peace Media. I am Dr. Christine Bacon, and I'd like to remind you always to live your life sunny side up.